Hi, my name is Ronan Kennedy, and today I am joined with Peter McGuire, who's very kindly taking the time to speak with us today. Peter, thanks so much for coming on to, to chat. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, so can you tell us, uh, what do you do? Uh, I am a freelance journalist, and I've been doing that since I was about 17. And so that's about 25 years now. And uh, I also do, in recent years, I do a lot of commercial copywriting as well. Okay, fantastic. So... Um, it's obviously uh, uh, an area that a lot of people would love to get into. I see, it feels like one of those real areas of passion. Can you tell us, how did you get into that? Uh, yeah, before that, I would say don't. <laughs> Run for the hills. Uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I, honestly, I kind of fell into it. I got involved in the college paper in UCD, in in both the college papers in, in different ways at different times. Um, and everybody, when I was growing up, would all tell me I was going to be a writer or a journalist. And part of me kind of... Um, push back against that. I didn't want to do that because it was what everyone expected of me. Um, and then as I was writing for the college paper, I was I got a job working in the Bray People, a local paper, um, which is a great thing to do, by the way, if anyone's interested in being a journalist, like try and get local paper experience because you really get on the ground and much more better experience than you might guess, you know, going straight into the Irish Times or the Indo or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of over time, then different little jobs came up and I was doing my master's and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And for about 15 years, until I was 32, I was like, I kind of just kept doing journalism. And I was like, I don't know if this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And then eventually when I was 32, I was like, actually, I think I actually do want to do this. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm still kind of here. Well, why do you feel getting experience with the local paper is better? Is it earning your stripes or? A little bit it's earning your stripes, but also like if you go in to like a national or, um, and I, I'm specifically talking about print media, by the way, because I don't really do uh, broadcast media. Um, so, yeah, you'll have to kind of take a lot of my questions, really apply apply to print. Um, but if you want to be a writing journalist, you know, when you're in a local paper, you'll be covering everything. You'll meet all sorts of people. You'll be kind of understanding how news comes into a newsroom and to how it works and to how it operates. Whereas if you're, you know, a, so you're kind of a bigger fish in a smaller pond in a, in a local paper. Um, whereas if you go into a big publication, you're um, you're a small fish in a big pond, and you know you can sometimes be a little bit. You know you're not gonna you're not gonna get as broad an experience as well. Yeah. You might be put onto a, a beast quite early on. Whereas in 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 uh, in local papers, you you're just gonna learn a lot more. You have to do bits of everything. You have to do all types of stories, talk to all types of people, right? Maybe a bit yeah. raw, bit more raw, bit on the uh, the the cold face, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Although. The future for the future for local media isn't looking fantastic in Ireland or indeed across the world at the moment. So I really want to ask you this because you've been, I, I suppose, over the past twenty years, like the, the whole media landscape has radically changed. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I've I've been kind of lucky because I've kept I've kind of kept going um, in my own career uh, at, at a kind of an early stage. I fell into. Um, kind of through people I knew and, and through where I was working. I fell into writing a lot about education mm. um, and kind of built up a bit of a specialty in that area. Um, and I think as a result, I've maintained consistent work. I, I've done a lot of other work. I've done a lot of investigative work uh, with Noteworthy, the um, investigations unit at the journal.e. Um, and I've you know, d done all sorts of various freelancing. But to have that base, that root in in a specialty, I think has has been really useful, and um, also I think you know I've been at this a long time. A lot of freelancers bail a lot sooner, um, and I, I just I haven't. I've been lucky to kind of get the work. A lot of people move from journalism into PR, um, which good for them, but it's absolutely not for me. What has allowed you to stick at it longer? Um, is it that specialism, or is it just? Honestly, good contacts. Um, good contacts. Uh, knowing how to pitch, and the fact that I don't have children, uh, I, there's no way I could afford to be a freelance journalist if I had to pay for kids. To be quite honest, and I think that's why a lot of um, freelancers do bail, you know, or it might be something else, like it might be a side a side job for them, or you know, they might not be the main income earner in the house, you know. Um, so a lot of them do bail because of that. Um, but I've just been lucky. I've got yeah. consistent work, which I, I guess I like to think it's because, uh, you know, when you're freelance, you're, you're always precarious. And um, I've never really fallen out with an editor or, or 
um, being fired. So not That's that great. I should be so, fired. So yeah. Well, being able to pitch your work, uh, be, being able to sell it, in other words, being able to keep good contacts, keeping in good relationships with editors, all those things help. What What about having like a diversity of, of writing that you can do across journalism and commercial and PR? Do you, do you, is that something you've done? Uh, yeah, really, really, really good question and, and really important, I think, to do that. Like I've, I really love um, doing some of the kind of the hard investigative stuff that I've done. Um, stories that have taken, there's one story that took really a year, like not a full year, but over time to yeah, to get people to trust me, to, to tell their stories. Um, and that's really great, but it, it just doesn't pay very well, you know. And that's not that's not because, you know, the editors are mean or the papers are mean. There just isn't a lot of money in journalism. Um, so being having that other that that other thing of you know writing for companies and writing reports and you know doing a little bit of social media um, has enabled me to do the the kind of the the harder more investigative stuff. I actually have also come to quite like. I, I kind of started to do the commercial side of things um, because you know the money was better. But I've actually kind of come to quite like it because it's a different type of skill and a different specialty. And you're also you tend to be talking to people there in on the commercial side of things that they actually really want to talk to you as opposed to when you're interviewing someone for something a bit more controversial and you know they're maybe sending you legal letters and and threats so right. um yeah i do I, I i like having both sides of it but i think for anyone coming up in journalism you read you're gonna need to have both like there just isn't enough unless you have a good specialty there isn't enough work out there um to to kind of to sustain being freelance if you're only looking to do investigative stuff um that's my, nice though is it's yeah. nice to have a, a, a variety of work right so you, you're doing about commercial and you're doing about the, the journalism but also you've got like um you have to use your own adaptability skills but also you're, you're spreading your financial risk or, or you're, you're getting financial stability by not having all your eggs in one basket so it sounds like a prudent approach as well as maybe interesting for you to have different different hats on yeah, I think so. And, and yeah, ab- absolutely necessary. Like, I think if I, you know, if I had dependents, if I had to look after kids as well, you know, I'd probably be only doing the commercial side of things or, or I would have got a, a full time job. But I really, really like freelancing. Um, I mean, I've had opportunities to to have staff jobs in media um, uh, very kind, lovely opportunities with, with great organizations. Uh, I just don't particularly like the you know the, the nine to five thing. I've always been a night owl, um, and I, I like the freedom that comes with, with with being freelance. It's not for everybody. A lot of people really need that stability, particularly if they have dependents. Um, but for me, I just I just cannot imagine. I, I've done it. I've done like shifts in papers, you know, where I'd be going in at a certain time and leaving a certain time, but it was still on a freelance basis. Um, I just can't imagine. I and I. I wonder, I don't really know how people do it. Uh, getting up at seven o'clock, getting the kids to school, getting commuting to work. Uh, sorry, I don't know if I should be saying this on your, on your podcast because I'm like tearing apart a lot of people who might be watching or listening to it. But um, yeah. Maybe they love every moment of it, right? Maybe they love every moment. A lot of, of them it. do. Yeah, yeah, a lot of them do. It just, it, it's not for me. And I mean, sometimes like I, I'll work late nights or, you know, I'll occasionally have to do a weekend or, you know, there'll be a big project and I'm working nonstop, but generally I can set my own hours and um, I can decide how much income I need um, and kind of go on that basis. That's great. I, th- I think it's nice that you can, you can choose your own adventure, so to speak, and then adapt uh, to figure out, okay, I, I, maybe I need to get a bit of extra income here or I need to have more stability over here. Can I, uh, but I'm also interested because the media landscape has changed quite a bit over the, uh, the tw- 20 odd years you've been working in it. The, I, I've seen recently that X, formerly Twitter, has started to offer people payments for uh, writing and publishing on the platform. Some people are very surprised to get it. Other people are like, well, this is never going to be enough to have any sort of, um, let's say, career out of it. What are your thoughts on that sort of self-publishing industry? Do you think it's going to take over? Do you think it would be something you'd gravitate towards? Yeah, absolutely not. I don't think uh, X or Twitter is. It used to be something. It used to be a real go-to platform for journalists. It was where news broke. It was where you, you know, you could find reliable, trustworthy sor- sources because they were verified. And since Musk came in and removed the verification from credible sources, you don't know. Like even a small example. Yesterday, I was just going through Twitter. I'm going to call it Twitter. 
uh, I was going through Twitter yesterday and I saw like a, a tweet from uh, du- at Dublin Airport. Three, four, two. Please, we're the official Twitter for Dublin Airport. Like, it's just not. No, I, I don't think any credible journalist really can. Maybe when you're starting out, um, but there's so much noise there now, and it's so hard to tell what's a reliable source and what's not. I, I would say stay away from us. I, I think it's on the brink of collapse. It, it's just, it's just not a credible source to, to be involved with as a journalist. Um. Perhaps, maybe, if you were starting out and you had some other, you know, you, you had other jobs as well. But if you're just building your platform entirely from X, which it's just, it's 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 rubbish. It, it's just not good anymore. It's a shame. It used to be a brilliant platform. So, no, I, it, it wouldn't be for me anyway, no. Okay, you don't see the credibility there anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, when reading about you, I was reading about the the awards that you've won, the investigative journalism that you've done, that you've done. So really important topics highly intense and emotive topics can you tell us how do you go about that process of taking on this really big sort of issue investigating it like i'm I'm fascinated i don't really know how that process goes you start with a blank page or how does it work Uh, sure this is a bit of a long answer so how long do you have um i like i started off like doing a lot of features um i i've done the odd new shift you know um but i've generally been a features journalist uh, all my life um, and inevitably when you're doing that, you just come across stories that you're like, oh, Jesus, there's there's something more to this here. And kind of just natural curiosity of a journalist, you you start digging. And part of you is like, oh, God, I don't really want to look into this because it's just going to be hassle and stress and it's going to be really difficult. Um, but I was very lucky. Um, again, a lot of luck. Uh, Sean Flynn, who was the former education editor in the Irish Times, the late Sean Flynn, um, he would he would hate he would hate to. Uh, to, to be described as a mentor, but effectively he was to me and to Anya Kerr and to John Downs and a lot of other journalists that Sean Flynn really helped. And he kind of trained, trained us a bit on the job um, and just helped us to really figure out the the right questions to ask. And also what was of interest, you know, cause I, I used to go to Sean and be like, Hey, here's a story. And he'd be like, no one's going to be interested in that. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Actually, you know, what's, what's the reader interested in? Um, so, a lot of then I got um, I got a funding in 2012 from the Mary Raftery Foundation, um, which was set up in honor of the late uh, pioneering journalist Mary Raftery. And I did a lot of work on, um, it was actually on sex education in schools and we did a series um, in the Irish Times. And I kind of enjoyed the, the probing and the digging. And a lot of what I did was kind of experience a, 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 as I went on. Um, and... Like, yeah, definitely, I, I've tended to do a lot of, in, with investigative journalism, a lot of it is, I've tended to do more social journalism than, like, environmental or uh, financial, um, although I have looked at that as well. Um, and inevitably, when you're doing social journalism, you're talking to people who are in distress. Um, and um, I, I, I like people, which is important uh, when you're doing social journalism, and I like to hear their stories. And also then... You also kind of, um, w- w- when you're doing investigative journalism and, and you're getting people to, to trust you, it takes a long time because they've, they've gone through some terrible trauma and a lot of what I do is just kind of get them to, to trust me really. Um, and sometimes in some cases, in one case that took about nine months just to get people to, to kind of see that I was serious about this. I think a mistake a lot of people, do, a lot of journalists make, um, and I don't really use the term investigative journalist, because if you're a journalist, that's part of your job, you're investigating. But a lot of journalists kind of go in barreling into a story and they haven't put the work in. They haven't mm-hmm. kind of gone to meetings or, or shown that they actually really understand this issue and they care about the issue. Um, so that's why it just takes it just takes a long time. And um, so I don't know if I've wavered so off the question Ronan. no that's perfect so it's very interesting that that's your kind of go-to is to build trust take time with them get to know them i suppose if they've been through uh, a stressful time that's maybe trust is what they've, they've they've lost a lot of in in whatever traumas that's gone on so it's really good you're, you're yeah. almost you're almost a, a counselor if you're asking a lot of questions and you're building trust over over time can i ask how do you deal with you know separating that those intense issues from your own personal life, because I, yeah. if I was in your shoes, I'd, I, I'd, find out, I'd be worried about taking those home. Right. Yeah. Um, well, like 
I got funding again from the Mary Aftery Foundation in 2016 um, because I had kind of done so much on um, sexuality and relationships education um, and the deficits there. And I kind of learned, and this is, you know, for some of your readers, maybe I might just give a little bit of a content or trigger warning for what I'm about to say that I am about to discuss child abuse. Um, so I, I totally, some of your listeners uh, might, might might switch off. Um, is, is that okay for me? Yeah, to, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. I won't get into, I won't be getting into any graphic details or anything, but um, so I kind of learned that when people are not educated about, uh, about sex and about relationships, they're actually much more vulnerable to abuse, particularly children, because they can't name what's going on. Um, and as a result, I just kind of, I started working with, it was actually with the Irish History Podcast with Finn Dwyer, who's an old friend of mine. Um, and we put in a bit of proposal to the Mary Raftery Foundation to do a series uh, in the Irish Times, kind of looking at the, the history and the present of child abuse, because um, there is a, a narrative, not so much around anymore, but there was certainly even eight, nine years ago, that a lot of it was, you know, strangers in the bush or it was the priests. And of course, most abuse happens in the home and it's by someone known to the child. And um, so we did a kind of a very extensive deep dive into that topic. And obviously, yeah, that's, you know, that that's a, a, a very difficult topic. I was dealing with a lot of other people's traumas. And I'll be honest, yeah, I, I found that one particularly tough. Um, yeah, I, I did. I found it particularly tough and I actually took a bit of time off after after doing that and I just I just went traveling I went around South America for a few months um, and then I came back and I was like okay I can keep doing this and I continued to look at that topic um, I looked at it again for the Irish Times and we interviewed a number of sex offenders and I inter- and then for Noteworthy which is what I won the Mary Raftery Prize for and Mary Raftery is uh, uh, her, her foundation has been very good to me. Uh, I have to, I have to say that you know, it's it's allowed me to do that kind of investigative journalism by funding it. Um, and noteworthy is is a uh, which is part of the journal. Um, also has a really good model where um, you're generally paid as a journalist for the story, whereas noteworthy will pay you a, a daily rate. It's it's not you know it's not off the scale or anything, um, but it it it's again it's it's a model that allows deeper dives to happen because it just it just does take long it, it does take long and it's not what most journalism is a lot of what journalism is is interviewing companies or you know mild or gentle stories or press releases coming in that you follow up on um it must feel feel very rewarding though to be able to put the work into that to talk to the 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 people involved and be able to share their stories or highlight an important issue or you know share share the message so that we can Maybe even I don't know. Recover as a society, society. Make sure it doesn't happen again as a society. Deal with it as a group. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I think when I first started doing kind of uh, more and like deeper, longer work, I, I quite naively was like, "Great, everything's going to be fixed." Um, and I can, I'm not, I won't kind of get into what they are, but I can point to two or three instances of stories that I did that I know really made a genuine impact, um, particularly around. Um, particularly around actually an issue that I don't really understand why it's become so controversial, which is um, transgender children um, who have always existed, have always been there. And that was the thing that I spent about a year just building up trust, meeting families, uh, meeting meeting young people who are trans and just hearing them and listening to them. Whereas I think a lot of the the media debate and the social media debate around this is, you know, it's they're, they're deluded, they're being tricked into this. And like, just when you speak to people, you also see, okay, like this is their truth. Like they're not making this up. I've, I spent months with these people. Like they're not, they're not choosing this life because, you know, to be cool. It's, it's a tough life when, when there's so much prejudice out there. Um, but I do know that like that, that at the time did make a bit of an impact in terms of, um, what had the government ultimately legislated on us. I won't get into how I know that. Um, but generally, apart from that, like you're, you're just you're kind of just chipping away. It's just chipping away. Um, and you, all you can do is kind of hope that that maybe this story will, you know, be part of a what like will be part of something that other people can build on. Um, which is ultimately kind of what happened with with um, sex education. Like there's been a lot of changes since I wrote about it. I. I'm not saying I'm responsible for those changes, but, you know, I know I played a part, not the part, but a part 
in, in, in moving that forward. So yeah, it's really rewarding. It's also then, maybe I'm sounding a bit cynical, but also when you kind of been at it as long as I have, I don't quite get the same thrill of seeing my name in print that I used to. Um, unless it's something that I've really put a lot of work into, but now I'm kind of I've been focusing so much more on the commercial side of things um, that I'm I'm just not doing as much of that that kind of work anymore. So just before we go into the commercial uh, as, uh, side of it, I'm really interested. Like when you talk about those, uh, let's say, sensitive things or motive things or things that that are the the the, the talk of the town, whether it be you know trans rights or whether it be the, the sexual abuse survivors. Uh, do you do you feel personally that you're uh, at the forefront of that? Like if there's social media debate or if there's people, everyone having their own opinion on, you know, you're the person who's written about it. Does that ever worry about you that people are writing harsh comments or they're criticizing you or having um, a problem? No, it's it's part of the job. And, um, you know, there are some broadcasters and journalists out there who really get very annoyed that people are pushing back against their views and their opinions, even though they're giving plenty of them. No, it's part of the job. If If, if you can't take that, you know, you shouldn't, like don't you have to have a bit of a a, a, a a tough skin and know that people are going to criticize and they have a right to as well um i mean sometimes it it crosses into you know just stuff that like it just doesn't make sense what people are saying or um it, it can border on abuse or be abusive but like it's part of the job um definitely my female colleagues have a lot tougher time you know i could like I could write something super controversial and nobody says anything um, negative to me. Whereas I've seen my female colleagues could, you know, could tweet something relatively banal, you know, like they're an article about how they like spring, you know, or whatever. And they'll just get dogs abuse. Why is that? Um, Because of misogyny, because there's so much sexism out there and because it's been enabled by social media. So in much the same way that a lot of female pop, a lot of female politicians are getting dogs abuse and you know some of them have been stalked and some colleagues of mine have been stalked as well and harassed even there's been legal cases about it and um, just social media has, has kind of enabled it's kind of enabled this so and i think it's a shame because it probably does put some women potentially off participating in you know in, in journalism or or in public life in that way um yeah i mean i've 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 had i've had you know i've had all sorts of things come at me um some of which, as I say, are kind of nonsense, really. But you know, yeah, it's part of the job. So, so you and your your colleague, your colleagues are you have to develop a thick skin to. I think uh, so. To continue. I think yeah. so, but you know, also you don't have to be on social media. Like I'm not. Like I, I used to kind of be more involved in social media, and now it's just like it's a lot of it is very, very toxic and very, very everything's so black and white. Like you even see it, I think. And it also comes back to a lot of the journalism that's been reported around the Israel um, Gaza conflict at the moment. You know, people are very much in their silos, and um, there seems to be a lack of kind of willingness to understand the history and the, and the reality of, of 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 where everyone might be coming from on yep. this. It's um, you know, and you you don't have to take part in that too. You know, you don't have to. Um, uh, for me, like looking at that, I'm like, okay, I can see how really polarizing social media is you know like when you've got 240 characters to make your point you can't get into the nuance or or the history of things so yeah yeah, i'm not i'm just not on it as much as i used to be i I feel i feel like you nuance has died uh about 20 years ago on social media um and also people seem to pick sides really quickly and they pick sides and they're like this is my team i've chosen my team uh no point trying to convince me otherwise do do you feel it was always or sorry do you feel like that it's like that now and do you feel it was always like that i I don't i don't think it was always like that not Mm. in my experience anyway um i think it's gotten really really bad now Mm. um uh, and you know like twitter was always like twitter started off as somewhere nice and fun and you could meet different people and do different things yeah but you know you can't you can't get across nuance in 240 characters you know like um y- you can't yeah it's it's just yeah it's not it's not the, it's not the place it was really um and it's not the tool you had to be on it when you're a journalist you had to be on twitter um you just you didn't really have a choice but now you could actually not really be on twitter because it's, so what's, it's what's the go-to now for research for journalists um ooh, you'd have to ask someone who's doing more uh, contemporary journalism than i am on that to be honest but 
Um, a lot of people are moving to Blue Sky. People have moved to Macedon, but it's all become so fragmented. Twitter was where everybody was at. Uh, but now I think they're, about, they're talking about introducing a payment, which I know they brought in in New Zealand and I think Fiji. Um, so I think that will be the final death knell of it. Um, I mean, look, I was working as a journalist long before Twitter came along and I yeah. did just fine. Um, it's, it's, it's handy because you can often, you know, say, hey, I'm looking for somebody who uh, wears pink, has a schnauzer and eats uh, burgers on Tuesdays and you would find someone. Um, so, yeah, you know, journalists are going to have to kind of go back to the old ways, which might not be a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, old school uh, investigative journalism, right? Might have to be rebooted. Yeah, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your commercial work um, and how it's Sh- different? Sure. Yeah, um, it's different because uh, I won't get into the payment, but certainly you're 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 talking to people who actually want to talk to you. Um, you know, whereas a lot of time people are kind of you know, they're, why are you ringing me? And you should be doing this. And you know, no, you're onto the you know, so are they threatening to sue you? And so you're kind of like I I. I'm, I'm conscious of who I work with. I wouldn't work with just anyone, you know, but I, I've worked with universities and I've worked with, um, I, I've worked with various companies and, you know, you kind of, you're interviewing people who work with them about what they do and you're helping to, or, or, you know, in, in the case of university students who went there and what their experience was like and just kind of helping to, to promote, um, what that's like for what that was like for them and what they learned or, you know, what, what they're doing, and finding good formats to put that out in, whether it's, you know, social media or, um, or, or blogs or, or websites or, you know, magazines. Um, and you're kind of a lot of the, that work in terms of pushing it, pushing it out there. I don't have to do that. You know, that that's what the, the PR team will be doing. So um, you're really about crafting the narrative, putting the story together. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask, how, how do you get that work? Because I guess if somebody's thinking of becoming a writer, becoming a journalist or, you know, getting into the world of communications, they're like, oh, I'd love to do it. I just don't know how to get my foot in the door. Was it your Irish Times brand? Was it, it your... It was, yeah? I have to say. Yeah, I think so. I, I think, it, you know, there's a real benefit to having like a, a byline in the Irish Times, you know, um, and sometimes people reached out to me to do work. Um, and, you know, I, I've reached out to some other contacts and people I know like um I, I don't know how good my advice will be for someone who's starting off and want to get into this because obviously I'm I'm experienced at it but it just it just does take time I really do think and I have said it before I think I've said it twice and um, I really do think it helps to have a specialty to kind of go right I'm going to focus on health or transport or consumer affairs or you know education or social affairs or, or whatever it is um and I think in doing that like people in that sector you know are people affected by things that happen in in, on the, in in those sectors will kind of develop a bit more trust, will give you a few more contacts. Um, and before you know it, you'll be, you know, you'll, you'll be working with all sorts of different people and all sorts of different tip. organizations. It's, it, it's like create your brand, right? Create your, your, your professional brand for your, your I writing so. career. I, I, I kind of, I kind of, maybe I'm you sorry, won't I, use those terms, right? I, I, I know your career guidance, a, a careers advisor on. And so of course that you, you, you would use that term. Yeah. I don't know. That just sits weirdly with me. I'm like, I feels no. like a dirty term. <laughs> it kind of does, but even networking feels like a slightly dirty term to me, even though I know I do it and we all do it. So, I mean, those are probably just my own hangups really, but effectively, I mean, I guess, yeah. In so many words, that's what you do and that people know what you can do. Um, like, and there are companies out there now as well, like, um, you know, Juno, Y-U-N-O-J-U-N-O, um, you know, and you can sign up to do freelance work with them. They'll give, they'll, they'll get a lot of work for you. Or the Indie List is, is an Irish one. I've done a bit of work with them and I found them really, really lovely and, and, um, you know, really fair and, you know, they, they, they pay on time, which is important. Um, so, yeah, and that is also something to be aware of, like, you, you have to kind of be, you have to be your own debt collector in, in, if, right. you, if you're going freelance. Um, Any tips uh, there? Uh, behave like a debt collector, really. Like, if, if someone has, if, if you know, like, there's one, one publication, uh, it's, it's none that I write for now, you know, but that, that they'd be paying you, like, 60 days after, after publication. Um, which could be, you know, publication could be delayed for a month or two, and then they never actually paid after sixty days, and you'd be chasing. And I was just like, not worth working for them. So, kind of find companies that will pay, 
Um, there was one company uh, a long time ago. Just they went bust. It was a travel mag. Was one of the things they did, and they went bust around the recession, two thousand and eight. And um, me and other journalists, like we just weren't being paid by them, and they didn't kind of, they didn't even say, "Hey, look, you know, we're we can't pay you." Like they only owed me one hundred and thirty quid. I actually would have let it go because I could see they were in trouble. But just just show me the courtesy of going. Look, I'm sorry, you're at the bottom of our of our list for payment. We've all these other people to pay. I'm really sorry, you know. And they would have gone, look, okay. But they were really, really horrible about it. And, um, you know, when I, I actually called into the office um, to just kind of see, hey, what's the story? <laughs> and uh, they were kind of obnoxious and threatening me with the guards and so on. So um, mm-hmm. I, uh, I set up an email account called I will never go away at gmail.com. Um, and I sent him uh, I sent him an email from that and he blocked that and um, when I finally sent an email from I will never go away 10 at gmail.com the payment was in my account the next day and I was the only one of those journalists to be paid so you have to be a little bit persistent and be willing you know I was like okay look I'm obviously burning this bridge with this with this company with this man um, but I don't want to work for him again anyway so um, it, it's a good idea, particularly with commercial work, to set out your terms. Be really clear in advance. You know, I, I will often ask a company, not in print, um, but I will often ask uh, commercial companies to pay me half up front and half on, half within 30 days of delivery and to have an agreed deadline as well. So that if it goes over on their side or your side, you know, that you're not waiting indefinitely for payment. Um, and companies that agree to do that, I give them a fairly substantial discount as well. So it works out, works out well for them. That's a great tip to, to yeah, to get uh, money in advance and at the agreed deadline. Yeah. I, I guess it kind of takes a bit of stress and hassle off you, you know, following up with them. Yeah, um, yeah. it definitely but- does. And like I've said to companies and it's never happened because since I've been doing this, it's never happened. I've said to them, like, look, and if, you know, if you don't pay me within 30 days, I'll just, I will invoice for the full amount. And, you know, I've said it very politely and, you know, it's all been very cordial. And they've said, yeah, of course, no problem. Um, it has happened once or twice that they were, you know, a couple of days late, but it only happened, it, it was like, it, they'd been fine every other time. So I was like, look, I'll, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll give you leeways on, on this. I'm not going to immediately send the invoice. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a fine balance, you know. And we're right. not great Irish people at asking to be paid and for the money that we've earned. Well, commercial skills are, are super important to actually make a freelance career viable. So I think yeah. they're, they're really good tips. Might yeah, you need to know case. your taxes as well. You've got to figure out your taxes and your All the exciting and, stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you get people asking for 150 changes uh, when you're doing commercial work? Can you change this? Can you change that? Can you change that? And how do you deal with that? Um, generally, I will always say at the outset, like, you know, if, if you want guys want internal changes, you need to work together and have a single point of contact for me. Um, because you have had the, you do sometimes get the experience of people kind of, um, you know, one person wants this change, another person wants that change, another person wants a change that contradicts the previous change. So to, to have a single point of contact is really important. Um, and whatever they want, you know, they're the client. You, you, you deliver. Um, if you don't, if you didn't like the experience of working with them, um, you still deliver, you still give them what you agreed to do and then just don't work for them again. Um, but yeah, ideally a, a single point of contact. I haven't really had someone come back and ask for 150 changes. There's definitely, there's definitely been substantial changes made, particularly companies will do that more so than, than editors in my experience because they have a particular brand and a particular message that they want to get out. And, and that's completely fair. So, you know, you might agree as well, like a num- how many sets of edits that you're going to go through. Um, but, you know, I'm probably in a slightly better position to do that than maybe someone just starting out, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's important as well for someone starting out to, to try and get that experience. It's also really important to have a portfolio. So don't just come out of college and go, hey, I'd like to be a journalist and go straight to the Irish Times or, you know, various companies that you think you'd like to write for. You need to kind of have proven that, that, that you can write. Um, I'm also lucky in that I think if I was 20 years younger, there's no way I could be just a print journalist. I'd have to have multimedia skills. So, you know, and I'm assuming this is, this podcast is probably aimed, you know, at people who are changing careers or starting off in their career. Um, I, I, as a journalist, you should try and have multimedia skills and you need to do a lot of CPD. You need to do, like I'm going to do a course in 
um, content design, which is not how you design websites, but where the content should be and how the content should look and how the content should interact with the design. Um, you, you, you have to you have to kind of stay fresh because the industry is changing so fast. Um, so, yeah, you always important be learning. to adapt to the yeah ever changing media landscape. Learn those multimedia. So learn to use the video apps. Learn like the Instagram, yeah. the TikToks, the Snapchats, yeah. all those things. I can get away with it, but I don't think I would if I was a bit younger. Fantastic. I love your combination of tips for <clears throat> actually getting into the journalism industry, but also the business skills of understanding the tax, the debt collection, oh, the tax, the, the <laughs> payments, all those super useful for anyone getting in. Because it, it is more than just uh, loving the craft of writing, of shaping stories. Um, yeah. And then there's the, the questioning, the interviewing skills. So you're really combining lots of different skills together. Uh, I will say one thing that I think people miss, and I don't think... Certainly a few years ago, I, I was looking into what were they actually teaching at journalism colleges. And they don't, they, at the time, it more than likely changed. Nobody was teaching them how to pitch. Um, and, you know, people were coming to me and going, how, 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 like, how do I, and they'd be sending me their pitches and they were terrible. Or people would be sending in like, hey, I've written this article. Have a look and see if you like it. Like editors get, you know, 200 pitches a day. You need to show that you can write and you need to show that in like five lines or less you know, keep your pitch really tight because if you can do that and you go, oh, that that's interesting. I want to hear more. You, you're showing you're a good writer by keeping it neat and tight. Editors don't have time for you reading stuff on uh, sent in on spec, you know, um, articles that are being written. So it's really important to learn how to pitch. So those skills weren't really delivered in the colleges? Uh, as far as I know, they weren't. I actually never formally trained as a journalist. I did okay. uh, arts in UCD and I did um, I did a, a research master's in Irish folklore, um, which was actually looking into uh, the history of missing persons in Ireland. Um, but I actually learned a huge amount on that as well. And then, yeah, I learned all my journalism on the ground. I'm not sure how much that's done anymore. I, I don't have a journalism degree. I have lots of you know small qualifications and upskilling stuff, but... Um, I would definitely recommend, by the way, if there's any younger listeners, do not do a journalism degree. Do a master's by all means. Yeah. But journalism degrees, I, I just don't really see the point of them. Um, you're much better off to do like science or law or arts or something that you kind of you do a broad amount of learning in and specialize for your master's. Or do, um, or do the topic you want to write about. So if you want to write about tech or finance or, or exactly, agriculture yeah. and then journalism for that. Do you yeah. think that would be better? Yeah. I mean, if you look at like a lot of a lot of good and well-known journalists, um, including the editor of the Irish Times, Ron McCormack, you know, he came through um, Trinity. He didn't do journalism in Trinity. I don't know if he did a postcard. He possibly did. But, you know, there's no journalism course in Trinity College. And he edited the college paper. Um, and whatever he did after that, I'm not sure. But he's now the editor of the Irish Times. And I think one of the the youngest editor, if not the youngest editor of the Irish Times ever. And there's loads of other journalists who, who got their start in, in college newspapers. Um, so yeah, I would I, I would have to recommend don't do an undergraduate course. By all means, do, do a master's. You'll get a lot of good contacts. Um, I think there's probably stuff I might have missed by not doing a master's. Um, but yeah, undergrad, total waste of time. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting. Do you, do you see yourself going forward, getting more into... Uh, video media, audio media, no. uh, as part of your journal. No, you're going to stick to print. Yeah, I like I like writing. You know, I, I find that um, even sometimes when I'm talking, ideas kind of seem to come through my fingertips rather than through my mouth. So, yeah, um, like look, I've done. You know, like occasionally you'll be on the radio or you'll be doing things like this. Um, you'll be on the radio to talk about your story or on TV to talk about your story. Um, you know, or you might do like I've done a bit of research for TV documentaries and radio documentaries, but the actual kind of production side of things, no. I mean, it's fascinating. I really love it. And one of my good friends uh, is, is a TV producer and I love talking to her about her job and, you know, how it relates to mine. And we, we have great conversations. But no, no, it's, it's, it's not for me. But I do think a journalist these days probably will need to be a bit more you know, um, they have to need to have their skills in print and in, in broadcast and in audio and um, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I think the live reporting is becoming more and more right. People reporting from their phones and uh, iPads and stuff like that is going to grow even yeah, more and I more. I think so. Yeah. Um, so uh, can I ask uh, to wrap up if you were giving yourself a uh, finishing college, finishing school, finishing your college, you're going to go back and give yourself some advice 
uh, it could be one of the key things you learned. Uh, what do you think uh, you'd tell yourself? One or two or three? <laughs> what? One one piece of advice, two pieces? How many uh, can well, I give here? Would you, would you, would you have uh, two pieces of advice? Uh, learn to pitch. Learn to pitch. Yeah, yeah learn to pitch. And... Um, Ooh, so there's so many things. <laughs> I, 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 I think, yeah, the, the main thing is actually uh, like learning to pitch. And then um, uh, maybe something I haven't said before, which is a bit more, more personal to me. I don't know if it applies to everybody else, but I spent so long worrying about, you know, am I going to have enough work? Am I, you know, and like month by month I did. And month by month I survived. And month by month I always paid my rent. And you know, month by month, I I, I never went hungry. So um, ju- just kind of take it month by month. Um, don't panic that, you know, shit, I'm not going to have loads of work. What am I going to do? Um, because I, I used to do that all the time. And I was fine. I, I, I did get there. And, you know, maybe if it, things had changed and I had months and months where I wasn't getting there, maybe that would have been time to, to look at doing something different. But... Yeah, just just go easy on yourself and just just take it month by month. It's not the easiest of professions. It's not the most well paid of professions. Um, so I think anyone doing it is is doing it because they right. they they really want to. Um, yeah, right. very good. So learn to pitch. Go easy on yourself. Right. I think it is nice to look if you are a freelancer and you're concerned about uh, income stability and stuff like that. To look at it over a longer arch of time, four months or a year rather than just this week or today or next week, right? Because that can make people get nervous or get anxious about that. Absolutely. But that said, that's also a bit of a luxury. You know, I'm very conscious that journalism is a very, it's a very middle-class profession. It's a very white profession. Um, you know, like, and that really isn't good enough. Like, we really do need to, to open up opportunities, um, uh, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also if you don't have people from certain communities in the profession, you're just going to miss a huge amount of stories. You're only speaking to a much smaller audience. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I, I would love to see, and I, I, I mentor some some young people um, from, you know, backgrounds that might struggle a bit more to get into journalism, because I'd love to see that. I think that's really important. Um, and a lot of people in journalism, they're getting there, like, these days, because, you know, they've, they've people who can support them those first few years. Um so I'd love I'd love to see more diversity in the profession. In, in Do you think that the sense. new media will facilitate that, whether it be Instagram or TikTok? Um, yeah, but I mean, a lot of that is influencing rather than necessarily uh, than necessarily journalism. I mean, there's a crossover for sure. Um, but yeah, like you, you might need to like if you don't if you're not fortunate enough to have access to 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 money, you know, when you're starting out and you're keen to get a job, like. Get your job, like, and if you still really, really want to, to do journalism, um, reach out to people, connect with people, um, and, and do a little bit, even if it's just on the side, build up your portfolio. Um, and, you know, it might be, you know, certainly in, in the initial phases, it might be that more of the work you're doing is commercial work because that's what's going to pay you. But, you know, I've gone from journalism to commercial work. You can also go the other way around. So, I just, yeah, I, I'd really love to see more diversity in, in the profession. Um, sounds, yeah, that sounds fantastic, what we need. So we get that a broad range of perspectives, or let's just say a representative level of uh, perspectives, right? Yes. Um, and yeah. uh, uh, so fantastic, Peter. Thank Thanks you so for much. Us, Ronan. Yeah, that was really for interesting. All your tips, insights, uh, really good uh, balance between journalism. And, and, and some tips on the business side as well. So I really appreciate you sharing your time, knowledge, expertise. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ronan. Okay, take care.